And it gives me great pleasure to introduce the second of our Barclays International Lecture Series for 2014. Uh, in particular, to introduce Case Christians, uh, who's lecturing today on the theme uh, of the city as a lot. Uh, Case uh, is an academic, he's a practitioner, uh, started his work uh, early on working for OMA, uh, and then founded KCAC, uh, and split his time between Rotterdam and KCAC and Zurich, where he's a professor at ETH in Zurich. Uh, more recently, uh, the uh, program leader for the Future Cities program uh, laboratory in Singapore, where he's just spent six months in Singapore, uh, researching the region uh, around Indonesia and Southeast Asia. <clears throat> I first met Case uh, about six or seven years ago uh, when he became an advisor to the Design for London team. A uh, huge privilege to work with Case as an advisor because what Case brought was a completely different perspective on how we should think about a city like London. Uh, a perspective which was not just uh, fashioned by his work in Holland and internationally, but also by his experience in terms of uh, teaching in academia. Uh, KCAP, uh, I think, an extraordinary uh, architectural and design firm. Uh, and they managed to strike that balance between intellectual curiosity and a very, very deep and sophisticated understanding of the city and how the city works with an ability to fashion uh, pragmatic, exciting, and very elegant solutions to urban form. Uh, and also with the huge integrity, it's important to take that through into realization. Uh, realization in a whole range of schemes uh, across the world, uh, but working initially on the uh, Olympic Legacy Scheme in London, other schemes in East London, uh, but in particular, uh, in Europe, the scheme which uh, speaks to mind for me is Harbin City in Hamburg, with that kind of spirit of the balance between uh, intellectual rigor uh, and integrity and design quality is achieved, I think, to a very, very high level. So with that, I'm going to introduce Case, who's going to speak for about 45, 50 minutes, and then there's a chance for discussion, comments, questions afterwards. Okay. Thank you for your uh, lovely introduction. Um, good evening. I will... Do you mind if I put the light a little bit off? Then you can see it better. Um, I'd like to talk tonight about um, City as Loft. As you can see, it's a book. I have it with me. You can have a look in it if you want. Um, and City as Loft is a special uh, concept that we developed uh, in our office uh, during uh, the times that we worked on uh, specific projects. Um, this is um, the uh, building Holzhaven that we built in Hamburg. I start with Hamburg and I end with Hamburg. And um, this is an exhibition of our work. Uh, you see here several of the buildings that our office built. Um, and they are posed in a position uh, in which you cannot tell whether they are um, objects in the field um, or whether they are part of a concept of space uh, in which they, co they um, the, um, constitute the, the, the walls of the space. It's a kind of flip-flop effect between the object and the space that is carved out of, uh, of the mass of the city. You see, it, it's 10 years ago. These are two of my sons. Um, now they are grown up. And they walk into a big model of this uh, Holzhaven building. This Holzhaven building um, is on the uh, edge of the River Elbe in Hamburg, in the city of Altona, the old Danish um, fisher um, city, the twin city of Hamburg. And as you see, it's a building that looks a little bit rough. The intention was also that it would look a little bit rough. It should look like a big brick um, warehouse. And this brick warehouse is perforated with holes, as you can see. Um, 
and here you see a section. These holes are asymmetrically mediating between the river Elbe on the one hand and the slope of the um, city uh, on the other hand, giving uh, perspectives from city to um, water and from water to city. The th thickness of 40 meters, um, which is not um, very functional for offices or apartments, uh, was cut open by these holes, one of them a big atrium which uh, constituted the entrance, so that you get an enormous amount of light in all corners of the building, being able to make different kinds of, uh, of spaces. Um, as you can see, the building is standing on the key of the Elbe, which is a cobblestone key in which there's not a real uh, clear division uh, between public and private. Uh, there's not a clear division what is street, um, what is uh, the um, space that is allocated to the building or owned by the building. It's a kind of uh, blurry situation. This is exactly um, where this uh, flip-flop effect between object and space, um, as you can see here in the lower diagram, and um, space card out of mass is all about. This is the um, urban design for the Muller Pier in Rotterdam. <coughs> we designed also about 10 years ago. And um, this was the first design that we consciously put this uh, relationship into an urban design uh, with many buildings. And as you can see, the um, model shows this um, blurry space, this unclear relationship between public space and the territory of the building, um, the unclear uh, condition of uh, whether a block is an object um, or is uh, really a perimeter block or not. And um, this, is a, uh, this is a property that buildings um, in harbor areas or in uh, former railway areas, you know London has also a lot of these uh, spots, um, contain. And this a space exactly is a type of space that um, attracts um, a kind of use uh, that, uh, that developed maybe during the 1970s and became uh, a kind of commodity during the 1980s and 90s and now is a more or less an accepted condition but at that time was um, something very special. You, you see the uh, Faculty of uh, Maritime Technology by Neutelings Architects. This is also a building by Neutelings Architects that um, exactly react to this uh, demand of uh, um, working with this, relation, this blurry relationship. Um, if you go to a loft, this is the Wyoming building in uh, East 3rd Street in New York. That was the first building where I stayed when I was in New York in 1979. I stayed with an architecture student. He would never be able to pay for that anymore. This was the uh, uh, interior of the space. And everybody, of course, knows that in the, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, the loft uh, lifestyle uh, more or less uh, developed in New York. At least uh, people think that that is the case. And the interesting thing of loft life is um, exactly what I just showed you in, this, in the urban condition, namely uh, that you use a space um, as a kind of uh, fluid uh, condition in which you place uh, your territorial elements like a bathroom or a kitchen or a bed uh, with a wardrobe. And um, on the moment that you carefully, strategically place these elements in space, um, the space get, gets activated, but the elements are also activated by the space. And so, for us, this is a very important formal aspect um, to use into public space, and we also used it later in projects that um, work with cultural activation um, in former industrial areas. A little bit continuing in history, um, if you uh, talk about this loft IV, um, in, in effect, it, it, the, the, the discussion or the discourse is about that the loft moves from the inside to the outside. Um, the kind of uh, experimental way of uh, working and living 
in a loft space um, goes down on the street. This happened in New York in the 1950s. Uh, this is the uh, former gallery of uh, Castelli, one of the uh, big um, emperors of uh, modern art later. You see here two Volkswagens. I don't know what they do there. But this is one of the first um, public happenings in the 1950s in the streets in New York. Happenings that were um, um, also named happenings by a group of artists um, that organized um, performances on the edge between inside um, and outside um, in this time. This guy here is Alan Karpov, the guy who coined uh, this word happenings. And um, I think there are three uh, important things um, about that uh, that could be um, um, maybe a kind of uh, ancient uh, history for, for what I'm talking about. Um, the first thing is that uh, art was, uh, um, like here in the paintings of Pollock, uh, declared as a process um, in which the process was more important uh, than the product. Um, art was uh, uh, moved from the studio onto the street. Um, and like here in Andy Warhol's factory, um, the um, lifestyle of these people became a network divided across the city um, consisting of uh, clubs, artist studios, exhibition spaces, recording studios, um, I don't know, heroin, um, um, injection lounges, and other things. Um, of course, New York is a myth, and the reuse of buildings and the kind of uh, informal use of these spaces is as old as, uh, as uh, human beings. Um, you know that uh, Piranesi already depicted uh, the uh, different uses of contemporary people in the 16th, 17th century uh, in the old uh, ruins of Rome. And here you see the Bateau Lavoir, uh, the uh, studio where uh, Picasso um, and Van Dongen, Case Van Dongen, um, in the 1915 uh, years uh, were gathering uh, and working. And also, uh, our own architecture history is very strongly tied uh, to the reuse um, of buildings in a kind of loft like way. This is the history of the Bauhaus after the uh, Nazis expelled them from the Bauhaus in Dessau, that was newly built by Walter Gropius. Uh, they first were uh, uh, moved to Berlin, where they occupied an old telephone factory in Stiglitz. And later, they uh, went to Chicago, where they ended uh, up in the top floor of this bakery under uh, Laszlo Mohol Neutsch, um, who reopened the Bauhaus, the new Bauhaus, in 1937, um, uh, with this space um, as a studio, which later became IIT, um, built by Mies van der Rohe. So um, we have a whole history um, of the reuse of buildings and of the, um, let's say, the uh, uh, operational manipulation of the space of uh, existing building and the reprogramming of existing buildings, um, not only in New York. Um, and we also have a very strong tradition already in the early 20th century um, of going out onto the street uh, with art performances, for instance, um, during the uh, early years of the Russian Revolution. This is a very uh, famous example. It's uh, the fourth year of the, or the fifth year of the Russian Revolution, celebrated in Baku, uh, where they uh, made a, um, a concert uh, in which uh, the, di the director, the conductor, worked with flags uh, to uh, conduct a whole army of uh, cannons, uh, factory sirens, uh, etc. And um, here you see Tatlin's Tower being driven through the streets of, uh, of Leningrad um, during uh, the parade. So it is a, it is a very um, gradually emerging phenomena that, uh, that uh, maybe became conscious um, in, uh, in New York. And of course, relationship with Paris uh, always was very important. This is the New York Atelier of uh, Marcel Duchamp 
you can re recognize his uh, famous hawker. And this is Gordon Mata Clark, his uh, godson, um, who uh, more or less um, dealt um, with the city um, and the effect of this activities on the street during uh, the early uh, 60s. But maybe for urbanism, um, Robert Smithson and Cedric Price, um, maybe the most important uh, persons. This is uh, the um, Monuments of Passaic by Robert Smithson, um, his hometown in New Jersey, where he uh, photographed um, wasteland elements and declared them into monuments. And by this means, taking up this, uh, this, this going out um, into, uh, into wasteland and turning the wasteland into a cultural landscape uh, that, uh, that was activated by his vision um, and therefore uh, becoming uh, an important uh, meaning on the, uh, on the artificial uh, scene. And this, um, of course, you may all know, the pottery think belt by Cedric Price, one of the most important British architects, who was the first one who made an uh, almost a regional urban design for the reuse um, of former um, industrial uh, buildings um, into an open university um, in Staffordshire, where there was a big ceramic uh, plant area, um, where people would move from one plant building to the other um, in trains that would have lecture rooms in which they would be educated and they would have dormitories, uh, mensas, um, auditoria, and labs in the former buildings of this uh, ceramic um, plant complex. This project is extremely um, important because it is a forerunner, for instance, for the IBA Emscher Park, the uh, International Bauausstellung in Germany, International Building Exhibition in Germany, that was the first conscious uh, large-scale um, activation of cultural space in industrial uh, buildings avant la lettre. You know, I'm a Dutchman, so I have been grown up with Provo. Provo uh, was a movement of uh, young rebels that directly came from the happening culture in New York. They also organized happenings. They called this happenings. They took the Fluxus movement uh, from New York to Amsterdam. And they were uh, famous for uh, creating uh, dysfunctional happenings, dressing up completely white in white Wrangler suits, um, and um, designing white plants. At the time that these people uh, were doing this, Rem Koolhaas, my former teacher and partner, um, was about the same age as this guy on the left-hand side, Lutz Schimmelpenning. And Rem Koolhaas was at that moment a journalist wearing a tie, uh, condemning these people as uh, confused uh, adolescents. Um, whereas a couple of years later, he went to study at the AA and was coined by Peter Cook as a boring fascist. Um, Lutz Schimmelpenning and Provo made a couple of white plans, and these white plans were exactly um, coming out of the happening um, to activate public space, but also in a functional way. So the first plan they made was the white um, bicycle plan. This white bicycle plan consisted of the fact that they collected as many bicycles as possible in the city of Amsterdam, sprayed them all white, redistributed them across the uh, city, and then everybody was allowed to use them. So it's a kind of predecessor of our uh, electronic bike uh, system that we also have here in London. Um, and it was working very well in the beginning, uh, but after about half a year it completely went uh, nuts because people started to lock the bikes, people started to throw the bikes into the canal, um, and um, the bikes um, in the morning, the bikes ended up at the central station, uh, and there was no other bike somewhere else in the city to use. And so they had to use trucks to redistribute um, these, uh, these bicycles. They also conceived uh, the first uh, electrical 
car system, um, which was the wit car, the white car. Um, this is the same guy, Lutz Himmelpenning. And here you see with the sunglasses our uh, minister of traffic at that time, um, who was forced uh, to accept this plan uh, to be implemented as an experiment in the city of Amsterdam. They were electric cars that had an enormously heavy batteries um, and they uh, had a charging time, as you can imagine, of uh, something like 12, uh, 15 hours. Uh, they were limited in, in size. Um, you could register to them. And um, they ended up having the same problem um, as these white bicycles. Namely, they would end up in the morning at the central station and then had to be put into a truck to be redistributed. They were, however, too big and too heavy uh, to throw into the canals. And they actually, they actually kept on driving um, until uh, 1984, and they were world famous. And the guy who invented them, Lutz Schimmelpenik, is still uh, one of the major consultants in his Amsterdam office. He is now something like 70 years old, same age as Rem Kohlhaas, 69 to be precise. Um, on uh, these kind of uh, urban distribution centers, um, of which we always maintain that uh, by the evolution of this concept, uh, they have a major um, impact on the behavior in public space. They also um, started the White Houses Plan, like you see here. The White Houses Plan consisted um, of a free letter uh, to, uh, to occupy houses, so it was basically the continental start of, uh, of squatting um, around 1965. Um, the, uh, the simple message was, if there's a house empty, you can, uh, you can take it, occupy it, uh, paint uh, the uh, front door white, uh, and this is a sign that you are uh, belonging to our community, and please let also other people in uh, when they are looking for shelter. Um, one of these people went to Denmark and founded Christiania, uh, which was uh, an old uh, army barracks uh, complex, uh, which was uh, occupied by a group of people and became the more or less uh, the symbol um, of the first uh, squatter movement um, in Europe, um, also leading to a kind of um, question um, whether an alternative society um, or a serious attempt of uh, urban renewal um, was, uh, was the alternative to this uh, development. Christiania became a mess. A lot of uh, drug addicts, uh, criminality, um, and it was uh, sometimes uh, regulated by the police. Um, it, was, it, it had a very difficult life. But um, indeed, it started, uh, it was a kind of moment uh, in which the um, revitalization of uh, industrial um, landscapes and buildings started to go into two directions. The one direction was the bottom-up direction, um, going out from squatters, from artists, from students. And the other direction was the discovery by the establishment of these structures like, for instance, the architect Beaufil in Barcelona, who um, uh, bought this old cement factory and created his office and his, uh, his, his living commune out of it. This is his, uh, his, his own uh, work studio. Um, so you see these two um, divergent movements um, in occupation um, of buildings, um, specifically in the east coast of uh, east and west coast of America and continental Europe, um, beginning to, uh, to evolve during the 1970s. I myself was uh, living and working in this tower in the early end of the 70s. Um, it's a famous uh, waterworks building in Rotterdam, uh, a squat by architecture students and young architects who just finished school. Um, the, editorial company 010 um, was a part of that uh, group. Um, we created uh, theater plays and exhibitions. We created a giant pontoon that was uh, 
tucked by a tugboat through the harbor of Rotterdam, um, in which the harbor of Rotterdam was the performance, and people were sitting uh, in this tribune where we were playing this constructivist music of these factory sirens that I showed you before. And we were working um, in the early OMA on projects like Pike de la Villette. And you see me here and my friend Gil with his Harley Davidson that was stolen when we brought the model to Paris um, in 1983. If we look then at the um, at the involvement, at the emergence of the um, establishment of this project, you see exactly uh, this divergence uh, on the one hand in Baltimore, in the um, um, revitalization of the harbor uh, by the Rouse Company as a top-down project development, and on the other hand, for instance, in Sao Paulo, in the uh, uh, factory that was being created um, by Lina Bombardi. In 1989, the um, government of uh, North Rhine-Westfalen in Germany decided to create the Iba Emsche Park. The Iba Emsche Park um, was um, a project that was aimed at um, making all the ruinous industrial installations um, of the former coal mining and steelworks um, industry operational for um, a new economic and cultural activity. And you see here, for instance, the uh, Kokerite Solverein, which was uh, turned into a heritage monument, um, including a swimming pool, had a theater and lightning, um, and in such a way established a kind of uh, landscape um, of, uh, of functions um, that revitalized this uh, industrial area. It's a very special moment because until then the uh, consciousness of uh, and the uh, activity of urban renewal in these kind of uh, uh, scales was only done by private project developers like Beaufield or only done uh, by <coughs> squatters uh, and culturally engaged bottom-up people in cities, but never being um, accepted um, by governments um, in order to create a strategic um, and new way um, of urban renewal um, on the scale um, uh, of a whole uh, urban region. Combinations of uh, new buildings uh, and the revitalization of uh, very impressive uh, old structures and um, you see here this kind of acceptance being caricaturally symbolized by the king of the Netherlands coming to this plant and declaring that the uh, reinforcement and the revitalization um, of, uh, of heritage is, uh, is very important. 1989 was also the moment that the Berlin Wall fell and on that moment this trend swapped over to the east uh, for instance, uh, in Moscow, Melnikov's garage that was uh, built in 1921 uh, was uh, recreated into a uh, art factory. Um, in Istanbul, the uh, former uh, electricity plant on the Golden Horn was turned into a university, a park, um, a museum of modern art, where in the university room of the architecture department, there was an enormous painting uh, showing the riot police beating up students, which now is almost unconceivable uh, under what is happening um, in Istanbul. And it also swapped to China. So you see that this kind of trend, which was a kind of idea of democratization and freedom, um, also um, infiltrated into more authoritative regimes. This is the uh, M50 plant in uh, Shanghai, where uh, uh, Yan Yang, this uh, painter, who was uh, 10 years ago not famous, and painted these kind of large calligraphic uh, paintings in his uh, apartment annexed studio. Uh, this is his dining table. This is where he looks television and um, 
I'm standing underneath an entresol where he was sleeping. They constructed uh, their own spaces um, in these um, old buildings of M50, whereas the neighbors were poor people uh, from the uh, People's Republic, uh, from the working class, or they were immigrants uh, living in these uh, spaces um, uh, temporarily to work in factories. And in 10 years, um, this process um, of upgrade and the popularity of this space um, started to work. You see the, uh, uh, this condition 10 years ago, and here you see this condition about a year ago. Um, here you see uh, on the right-hand side derelict buildings where artists were living, and here a new building built and designed by artists. And this indicates that this, uh, through this kind of jump to the east uh, and through this uh, moment of the Iba Emscher Park in 1989 that a real uh, state government took over the, uh, this kind of revitalization as an official government policy also meant that the um, difference between top-down and bottom-up, between the squatters um, and the um, artists on the one hand, um, and the project developers on the other hand was blurred because squatters became project developers and, de and project developers became squatters. A, a very nice example here in England is uh, Urban Splash in Manchester, if you have been heard of it. So if you, get, if you go to M50 10 years later, you see here a guard in uniform. And Yan Yang is not there anymore personally. The neighborhood uh, adjacent that was still living, uh, livable before is being gradually taken down. And these are the cars of the painters. Um, this is their club. And this is the, uh, one of the galleries um, that now is in M50 um, showing paintings of them run by a Swiss um, art gallery. It's a, it's, a, it's a domestication um, of the um, revitalization of loft space. Um, and it has, of course, uh, certain consequences, um, which can be called positive, but can also be called uh, um, negative. It spread across China. Uh, it spread across Taiwan. Um, it even landed in Singapore and in um, Thailand. And here you can see, for, in, for instance, the uh, Dafen village in Shenzhen, which is an old village where um, all the residents in the meantime have started painting copies because they deliver copies to Western clients of uh, Van Gogh's and other paintings for around uh, 20 pounds, 40 pounds uh, each. And um, our colleagues, urbaners, architects from Shenzhen, young architects from Shenzhen, who got the commission to make the pavilion of Shenzhen on the expo in Shanghai, um, mobilized 450 painters um, in this village to create each a panel, um, which would be a fragment of the Mona Lisa of, uh, of Leonardo da Vinci, uh, that would be compiled into a facade of, uh, of six by 25 meters um, in, uh, in this uh, space. And if you go to Shenzhen now, to this spot, you will see um, the uh, official, officially endorsed and also officially funded Biennale of Architecture um, housed in former um, grain silos um, symbolizing um, former gardens, um, making the reuse of these buildings even more sophisticated than we do it. Um, and what is maybe most interesting is hybrid procedures of development um, are emerging. Um, in Shanghai, uh, in the French concession, there are several neighborhoods and industrial areas um, around them um, that have been tried to become developed. Um, into a nice compound uh, where tourists come, where you can have your pizza and Starbucks, uh, etc. 
This is mainly done by uh, overseas developers uh, from uh, Chinese uh, descent, people from Taiwan, people from Hong Kong. Um, they try to redevelop uh, this part of the city. Um, and um, this guy particularly uh, started to do uh, one of these neighborhoods. And he didn't manage because there were so many people with use rights um, and with, with also with a certain legitimacy of use rights, which is very special in China, that they couldn't be um, expelled. Um, that the project that he wanted to do did not work. But instead of going away, he made a deal with the people and the authorities to create uh, a project together. And so um, this project consists of um, top-down projects uh, that have these uh, art galleries, uh, for instance, completely financed and nursed by uh, a Western way of uh, dealing with loft redevelopment. But it also has um, existing houses that have been not re, uh, redone, and it also has um, newly uh, renovated houses and spaces uh, where people with use rights are still living, but at the same time uh, renting out space to new functions. And it has very interesting uh, consequences. For instance, this couple um, used to be poor. They used to be hardly having food enough and, pen and a pension, a very low pension, to live, but they had the use right to one of the Lilong houses. And um, by this project, they became uh, homeowners, uh, renting out the ground floor to, uh, to a gallery or to uh, another shop or something like that, and immediately became, for local standards, uh, quite prosperous and, will, and, and have a very nice old age now. Um, this, these processes we are researching, for instance, um, in our work to also to reprogram uh, neighborhoods and industrial areas in Europe because these processes haven't been seen before and it's very interesting um, how they function. It is also not so that Chinese developers all want to develop large-scale towers and demolish everything. You can see that there's a gradual um, consciousness uh, that was instigated by these projects that I showed before that, uh, that, that deals with uh, grain and that has also um, a very strong antenna uh, for the microeconomic processes uh, that are uh, happening in these compounds, in these industrial areas or in these combinations of industrial areas and neighborhoods. For instance, you see a lot uh, of uh, young fashion designers uh, that make one-of-a-kind uh, fashion products that um, uh, use um, older uh, sewing studios, sewing production plants to produce their clothes. So you see this kind of service manufacturing link um, uh, emerging by means of this, uh, this urban revitalization. And this is a very important aspect um, of the of inner city redevelopment um, on this moment. So we're trying to, to use the knowledge uh, that we derive from these field works also um, in our projects ourselves. We have also always been in old buildings as an office. This is our office in Rotterdam. It's the old um, Nestle chocolate factory um, in, uh, in the harbor of Rotterdam that we uh, redeveloped. And this is our office in Zurich, um, which is an old waterworks building, like the one where we were working with OMA in Rotterdam in 1983. Um, and the people who rent it are not only architects, there's a dance studio, uh, there's a car sharing place, there is a fashion designer, um, and there's a graphic um, design place um, working together in this old building. This is our new office in Shanghai, where we found a beautiful old mini that we are also redesigning on the moment. Um, so you see that um, I've been growing up um, in squats, in old factories. And during my work, I've been, I've been um, 
gradually turning into an action uh, urbanist, um, into a kind of official urbanist that deals on a, on a governmental level with the development uh, of these schemes. Um, this is an early example of, uh, of a design by OMA that we did, which looks like a grain silo on the edge of the uh, river. And this is uh, OMA's latest building in Rotterdam, which you can clearly see is a derivation of this 1980 uh, design. Um, a grain silo uh, reference, an industrial building um, that stands in the middle of the city. Um, it has become a kind of trend in the Netherlands. You see here the Eastern Harbor area of Amsterdam, where you have a, a ironic parody on workers' housing, if you like, and a ironic parody uh, on grain silos, um, if you like, a relationship between big objects and the kind of tissue um, of urban development. This is one of these grain silo buildings, um, all with lofts, um, having a kind of cloth in the uh, tissue of uh, 17th century uh, damask and, uh, and gold uh, sticking. And here you see um, one of the latest projects that we do, a combination of warehouses and new buildings, in which the new buildings um, are diving across the old warehouses, uh, like uh, a Lisitsky building, and in which you see these uh, rusty spots referring to the old shipyard history uh, in the concrete prefabricated uh, structure that forms the facade. Um, this is only formal, but as I showed you before, we are dealing very strongly with programming. So this project, this particular project, was a 39,000 square meter um, development in which the developer wanted to develop A1 offices and A1 apartments with penthouses uh, and expensive restaurants on the ground floor. And we convinced them that if they would do that, you see these kind of things also in the Isle of Dogs, for instance, then you would um, make a compound that would be autistic in itself, and it would not have a catalytic effect on its surroundings. And we uh, proposed to them that we would make a mixture between uh, urban functions that were top, top down and urban functions that were bottom up. So we proposed them to do one block social housing. We proposed them to do one block extremely expensive housing with extremely expensive penthouses. We propose to them to do uh, one warehouse in studio uh, spaces for artists that are not too expensive. And we propose to them to do extremely expensive offices where international lawyers uh, can have their place. And we managed to get um, a 15 restaurant, which is a formula uh, by Jamie Oliver, um, settled in the basement um, so that you now have the situation that in this restaurant 15, where former criminal youth are waiters and, and helping in the kitchen, um, are serving um, international lawyers um, uh, during their uh, lunch. And it, it resulted, we also have recording studios um, in this building, um, and it resulted uh, in the fact uh, that this spot uh, became a hot spot in the harbor of Amsterdam, where people go. Um, and the eventual effective, and that is most important when you talk to investors in these kind of projects, is that the eventual value of the real estate is at least as high um, as, uh, as their estimated revenues when they would have only realized extremely expensive functions. And I think the message of the city as loft is not only this formal dealing with space and uh, loft space going out and has, having this blurry space where you can activate the public space with cultural functions. But especially also as an urbanist, it's extremely important to work on this programming aspect 
And that's why we very strongly um, work on this programming aspect. You see the city of uh, Perm in Russia, where we were working on the master plan. I will not show that yet now. Um, the city was, uh, for a certain time, it was uh, a kind of cultural center uh, of the new Russia until Putin uh, stopped it a couple of years ago. Um, but um, we made, as an example of this uh, action, urbanism, which, re uh, which returns now in the form of an official activity or as, an, as an international urbanist, um, we said, okay, if we make a master plan for the revitalization of a whole city, we have to create facts on the ground. And if we create facts on the ground, we have to make facts on the ground that are sense, that people sense, that people can see that uh, something is happening in the city. We took this old ferry building, which was a derelict Stalinist ferry building on the river that was not used, and turned it with uh, the sponsoring of a tycoon uh, into a um, museum of modern art. We also attracted an international curator um, who organized an exhibition of Russian artists that made speci specifically for this first exhibition uh, new pieces of art. Um, and we opened the exhibition um, within six months of conception. And here you see the, uh, the, the, the museum as it is. And here you see my students visiting this museum. And you see here one of the Stalinist facades being copied in, uh, in plastic tape by one of these uh, avant-garde Russian artists. Um, we organized a competition. This competition was uh, juried uh, by uh, Brodsky, a rebel architect from Moscow, the tycoon, the minister of culture, the curator, uh, me, and some uh, heritage people. We were almost fighting. Um, and um, one of the artists recreated the uh, 010 um, constructivist exhibition in St. Petersburg from, I think, 1921, where Malevich uh, showed for the first time his uh, black square um, in the form of uh, a colored version where all the pieces of art are made out of meat, out of real meat. And so this, this um, museum was built six months, within six months of conception um, with the help of uh, residents, with the help of politicians, with the help of uh, curators that were attracted, turned into a performance, but at the same time into an official building that activates its public space and its direct surroundings around it. Um, and that's, let's say, how I like to work. I don't like to work as a designer, SEC. Uh, I like to work as a kind of uh, impresario uh, between people uh, to, to find projects rather than to, than to be asked to do projects, uh, and then to develop projects uh, into a kind of viable program, which then, of course, is turned into uh, an urban design, and then, of course, is turned into a specific uh, set of architectural ensembles. But this is all, let's say, part of the game. And today I'm working on this scale, but I think it, it didn't, uh, we don't uh, lose our attitude. I'm working on the scale of, uh, for instance, the Hafen City in Hamburg. Uh, we also worked on the Olympic uh, legacy in London and in, on the Royal Docks. And um, in this project in Hamburg, um, you see that this thinking is also coming back. So you see, for instance, this is the um, Elf Philharmonic by Hudson von Dermeron, uh, built on an old warehouse. Uh, this building is 10 times more expensive than uh, it was offered to and almost ruins the city of Hamburg. Um, you also know the project by Herzog and Dermeron uh, for the Tate Modern here. Uh, it's an iconic way um, and also a, a domesticated but a very good way um, of reprogramming an existing 
um, harbor condition um, into a cultural building. And even Ram Kolas is going to build a building there. It's going to be this ring. Uh, it's called the Science Center, but it may also become an aquarium, I don't know, or a cruise terminal. Um, the interesting thing about these industrial buildings is that in many cases the, the function that they have later, in other words, the function where they were not designed for, makes the buildings more interested, interesting than the program where the buildings were designed for. So that's why we always also say, uh, in a sense, you can forget about the program we have written this once in an article called Fuck the Program um, in reaction to Ram Kulas's, um exclamation fuck the, fuck the context because we do not fuck the context this is not fuck the context this is in uh, on the contrary this is uh, very carefully dealing with the context but fuck the program and in the end it all is about um, the reflection um, of urban life in public space and the way you activate public space uh, by carefully programming um, buildings because programming public space is very difficult and is mostly not working. So programming quarters and programming program of quarters and buildings in order to activate this public space is the most important. The role of um, old structures in this process is being described in this book. We have taken uh, something like uh, 30 projects out of 150 that we researched to, uh, to publish in detail. You see all these projects. And this is an example of uh, the Yokohama waterfront warehouses where the office of uh, Rick and Yamamoto is housed in. And every project in it has a page which uh, depicts all the essentials, the financing, the, in the initiation, the programming, the position in the city, the uh, uh, um, proximity of public transport, the mix of uh, programmatic uses, etc., uh, etc. Et um, there are comparative uh, diagrams and there are very interesting articles in the book, for instance, by Tom Bloxham from Urban Splash, um, or by Andy Pratt, the um, pop music sociologist from the London School of Economics. They all wrote articles on this programmatic economic heritage programming phenomena that makes up City as Loft. Thank you very much. Illustration of the journey from radical youth to, can I say radical middle age? I don't know. But the values have stayed there uh, and the idea of architecture, the architects of the side, uh, who actually becomes engaged uh, and actively tries to see change happen to the bottom up or the top down is absolutely integral to that and your work. Uh, we've got about half an hour. Uh, can I open it up to Questions, comments, responses? Hey, do. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for the lecture. Um, I actually just would like to elaborate on one of the words that you used, um, which is domestication. And, and you were talking a little bit about kind of cultural production and its domestication in certain kinds of projects. And uh, I guess projects that are kind of scared of any people, you know, development and this kind of thing in the city. And if, maybe if you could talk about this idea of domestication, how you would understand it in, 
being with us or something that would not be domesticated, for example. And I thought it was interesting because let's say we like domestic spaces, like living spaces, residential spaces. Yeah. You, should, you go from kind of squats, and I thought to the end, yeah. it's kind of like incredible bargaining with the developer to get some studio spaces and some social housing. Yeah. And et cetera, et cetera. So yeah. if you could expand on that. Yeah, maybe maybe it's about but under domestication. I mean that uh, let's say uh, the society in the 1960s and 70s was very polarized, and um, and you had a clear dis distinction between um, protesting uh, artists and intellectuals on the one hand who were poor, um, and uh, and the establishment uh, of uh, of the building uh, uh, com community who uh, who earned their money by building uh, apartment buildings or uh, office buildings or whatever. There was not much conversion going on yet. And um, uh, so um, in that time, there was, a, there was an enormous uh, polarization. And if you look 30 years later, you see that, uh, that this condition has been fused. Uh, for instance, uh, or maybe already earlier in some specific cases, like Andy Warhol was a big landlord. Um, but that was still in a kind of uh, fringe mode. Um, and um, uh, you see that, um, uh, let's say, in my biography, until the end of the 1970s, uh, every attempt to do a serious project like that, to program a, a former industrial plant, uh, including some surrounding uh, neighborhoods, uh, upgrade uh, was not accepted by uh, the politicians or by uh, investors. It was more or less uh, totally domesticated in the 1990s because many of the protesting generation of the 60s uh, became directors of housing corporations and elderly and so on in the 1990s and to give them this kind of experience and kind of look at it from another way. And in, uh, in the East Block, it was completely taboo. Uh, even after 1989, uh, in Prague and Budapest, there were, uh, there were severe uh, impressions of any attempt to, uh, to start, and also Istanbul, for instance, any attempt to start uh, these kind of, uh, of revitalization process in the city. The, the project that I showed in Istanbul uh, was effectively a project that was initiated by two Turkish students, upper class students, who went to London to study uh, electronics, uh, came back to um, Turkey, uh, founded a, phone, a mobile phone company, uh, became very rich by this small phone company, then decided that there was not an adequate, adequate education, uh, not an adequate university uh, in Turkey, and decided to create a fund by selling the mobile phone company to government and use the money to create um, this university. Uh, did it together with some local architects. The local architects uh, proposed not to make a campus, but to take some old breweries, schools that were derelict in old neighborhoods to activate these neighborhoods by the university. Um, so they, they established an atomized university consisting in the first uh, years of three buildings that were far apart and that were, were in kind of uh, poorer neighborhoods. And um, by the sheer presence of these faculties, the neighborhoods started to upgrade. People started to open the coffee shops. Uh, people started to rent out rooms to students, and so on. And um, in the end, they, they took the jump and took this old uh, power plant um, and turned it into this uh, uh, park for the neighborhood, the Museum of Modern Art, which is now closed because government retracted the money uh, and um, the uh, faculties in this old 
um, you have to compile that. So let's say um, what I mean that the process of domestication is the total uh, this uh, um, polarization in the beginning uh, and the choice between uh, Beauville and uh, Lina Bombardi, so to say, um, merged into very complex processes in different countries that all were also sometimes very specific, but eventually were accepted both by the politics as well as by the, by the uh, uh, investing parties um, as an official way of, uh, of project development in urban renewal. And uh, I think that is kind of interesting. It's been a bit down like that. Look, if you set some points of control, 
and you leave some leeway here, then you get a neighbor. And you can also solve your uh, housing problem without paying for it, which, which is more or less the base of existence for Istanbul. And Istanbul is for about 80% of its surface, originally squatted land, in which people build one house for themselves overnight, the so-called Gitsu condo, uh, after which they were not allowed to be uh, kicked out anymore. And then after a couple of years when they were stabilized, they would start to exchange their house for an apartment building, like all these villages in China, make seven four apartment houses, pay the contractor by living in two apartments, uh, keeping yourself two apartments one to live in, and renting the rest out and making a living out of that. Um, and then create uh, sewer systems that are then uh, legalized by the government. And so the municipality has a free uh, urban extension, um, which turns into a vibrant city neighborhood uh, without having to pay anything. So it's a kind of, uh, it, it is, the municipalities also in Shenzhen, they realize that this kind of uh, giving leeway now um, leaves them uh, with a lot of, uh, or frees them of a lot of trouble, of obligations to create uh, new master plans, new technology, etc. And so, we call these processes loophole processes because there's a loophole between uh, the different interest uh, powers that work on such a side. That happens also in the uh, in these Shanghai sites. So you have on the one hand, you have a local uh, district government that uh, says, okay, uh, the old workers in the legal areas, they have a huge right to live there. And this is a kind of social housing uh, program and obligation that we have to um, endorse. And on the other hand, the central municipality says, ah, oh, these people have to go somewhere else. Um, they can go to the suburbs. Um, and then there's a developer who buys some strategic plots. And so you get the same kind of gridlock uh, in which uh, you get these special effects like these old age people who suddenly have a, have a nice old, old day. So we are interested in how these processes work in order to see whether they can be turned into policy recommendations or design guidelines in other places. Question. On, on a follow-up on that, um, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, the book which you presented, which is a catalog um, of principles of, of from economic strategies all the way to um, to design principles, uh, I suppose, from the kind of diagrams which you showed at the very end. Um, how does this catalog of ideas actually transfer into a mode of practice, or how has it shaped, for example, your your interventions for the master planning of uh, Hafen City in Hamburg? Um, so do you see the kind of repository of cataloging research, which is yes, yes. Um, one academic sense, um, transferable into modes of practice? What, we, what, what is special on the, on the half the city master plan is that uh, we said uh, we should make a master plan that is uh, very flexible, uh, that can uh, accommodate a lot of surprises in the future, but at the same time creates uh, an urban and formal uh, coherence. And we did that by making a framework of public spaces that's very strong. This, of course, is not so difficult because you have all these harbor bases that are automatic uh, public space, so to say. But in between, we laid a very fine mesh of, uh, of streets, uh, a street pattern that is uh, multi-directional and fine, so that there's a lot of accessibility for pedestrians. Uh, that's defining blocks. Within these blocks, we have a lot of freedom. We have only uh, dimensional rules, and the rules in relation to both, for instance, uh, publicness, semi-public, as privateness. Um, and, uh, and we have certain uh, requirements for minimum percentages of housing uh, um, and, uh, and grade level uh, 
approaches, etc. And then, uh, in, in, in collaboration with the development company, which is a 100% city daughter, uh, there was decided that every building in a hub city is a competition. Um, and um, so, um, the competition uh, is, uh, is consisting of a brief and of uh, urban design guidelines for every plot, in which we try to make a fine grain of diversity in buildings, so not too big and not too small. Of course, small is okay, but not too big. Um, and um, the result of the competition is then allocated to the investor-architect combination, but they only get the land when they hand in the building permit. If you hand in a building permit, you have to pay uh, the legal fees, which is a lot of money. So if you do that, then you are also uh, sure that you're going to build. So they only, they only get the land when they put in the building permit. And so the construction is guaranteed. So this half a city grows incrementally. Um, in these blocks, um, blocked in by the, by the street path. And um, there's a lot of great uh, level public functions. Well, there are no public functions. We define that the first two layers have to be um, flexible for public functions and that you are able to build an entresol in the first uh, floor, for instance, so they have to be five meters or so. Um, but there is a clear invasion um, of uh, microeconomic activity in the house. Also in a negative way, because a lot of these pioneers uh, didn't make it. Uh, also, a couple went bankrupt because there was not enough critical mass. They were too optimistic uh, for the critical mass of residents and, uh, and workers that came down. Which, for instance, led to a mechanism in which they got uh, uh, very low rent for the first three years in certain areas in order to stimulate that these functions come but not burn them with an excessive uh, market rent, expected market rent uh, for the uh, Harvard City, which is normally would uh, be asked for the Harvard City. So this is, uh, these kind of, uh, you see that you have a mixture between administrative um, and, uh, and design rules and, 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 and controlling everything. It's very important uh, to, to combine uh, the, the administrative with the design guidelines, um, because otherwise uh, you, you get no. And so, for instance, uh, there is also uh, a certain allocation for collective uh, clientship. So there are in Hamburg you can register uh, with uh, the uh, authorities with a group of people. Uh, in many times. Uh, X68 or 65 uh, that want to, uh, to build an old age home for themselves with a group of 20 friends and have uh, common collective uh, apartments for guests and, and, uh, and grandchildren and so on. <coughs> but this is a market and it's a very good market because these people are conscious, these people um, are asking good architects, these people have uh, uh, an ID for the grade, for the ground, for uh, use, etc. So there's a certain uh, there's a certain amount of uh, of built volume reserved for these collective clients. And so in this way, there's a kind of mixture uh, being developed. There are also international headquarters occupying one block. But that's good because you have a, you have this kind of social stratification between very luxury and, and uh, just, let's say, uh, affordable housing. And this is the way um, we try to program that, that we have certain spots where we say that public functions uh, should, should come, and we allocate existing buildings as uh, to be preserved uh, at all costs, uh, and to have a specific function to that. So, let's say, uh, several Ideas, principles, or experiences out of this past uh, come together in such a uh, new urban design. But on the other hand, it's also hardcore, large scale uh, capitalist uh, insurance companies, uh, etc., that, that are on top of it. 
So we mediate between these parties. Question? Um, I can't really remember what the building is called, but the one with the Jamie Oliver restaurant. Yes. Um, I was wondering, I mean, from what you've described, your aim is also uh, to revitalize the neighborhoods. I was wondering um, how, if you could describe or tell us about the process you went through to decide what you put into that building in relation to the rest of the surrounding area, or the, the residents who are in it. Uh, we're not deciding anything, we are recommending. Um, so let's say if you do such a project, you have quite a, gr a large group of, uh, of stakeholders. Uh, you have the municipality, and don't say like many developers in England that the municipality is nuts. Uh, you need a strong municipality. You also need people that put brains in the municipality, especially in the in the complex urban conditions. Um, you have the developers, you have potential users that they already have. Uh, you have uh, yourself as an architect. You have uh, owners of uh, parts of buildings that are uh, part of the team. So uh, the, uh, that's why I'm saying you have to be a combination of a designer and an action and an action organist. Uh, you have to create the project. Uh, both on the physical as at the procedural level, uh, by by monitoring and mediating in such a stakeholder uh, process. So, your um, if you want to do these projects um, in a in a good way, then either you uh, or, a, or a strong partner that you have works on this on this stakeholder management. Three more questions, yes. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I wonder what you think about what's happening now in a lot of places, and in particular in the Netherlands, where a lot of office spaces are left empty. And yes. in places like recently I was in The Hague, and it was the Ministry of um, Interior Affairs, a very big building, incredibly central. It was also the heating was on, so the building was, you know, the services were there, but it was empty. And there are a lot of these uh, spaces. Yes. The Netherlands has a bit of an American foreclosure problem. Um, they have, the Netherlands has, a, has a, a little bit of a wrong taxing system uh, when it comes uh, to uh, development of, uh, of new office buildings um, and also of, uh, uh, of, uh, of housing uh, because they have so uh, such a uh, interesting ways of uh, tax deduction uh, while constructing uh, that an economic crisis does not immediately lead uh, to a uh, to a stop of the market but the market uh, goes on a couple of years before it becomes really serious uh, so you get a bubble of, uh, of uh, over capacity and too many uh, too much building volume uh, that when the crisis starts uh, you don't know what to do with it and this is what has happened in the Netherlands. So there is on this moment an extreme overcapacity, uh, both on the residential as well as on the office market. And um, uh, they also uh, uh, built a lot of uh, buildings in bad spots, uh, which are not uh, accessible by public transport, for, the, for instance. And um, all these buildings are paid by by the famous Dutch pension funds and so on. And um, on the moment that these buildings uh, devaluate, then the official uh, um, stock, the official uh, capital of these pension funds also goes down. And then their members become angry. So they keep the value of these buildings artificially up. And, and consequently also the rent and so they're not rented out. They can also not be converted into housing or vice versa. And so you get a lock. And this is a serious problem. In fact, they would have to uh, devaluate an enormous amount um, of buildings um, in the Netherlands um, on this moment in order to kind of restart and uh, reboot uh, the development market. 
And it's a very sad situation because uh, they just uh, spoiled an enormous amount of, uh, of landscape uh, that uh, would have been landscape when they would have been building that. And this is due again to the situation that um, it's very hard uh, to control um, urban development uh, on a regional level. In Holland, the municipalities are so strong uh, that and they are they all have interest in, uh, in getting their taxes and getting their employment uh, right. So they uh, they try as much to build themselves, uh, no matter what the neighbors. Um, this is this is for instance not in Switzerland because in Switzerland the development is more or less controlled by the canton, which is the larger region, uh, if you like, the county. Um, and um, this is different in, the, in many countries. But let's say the autonomy uh, of smaller units of municipality in, uh, in, the, in the polycentrical agglomeration is very dangerous for, uh, for the development um, of too much building stock on the wrong spots. Okay, we've got time for one more question, if there is one. In which case, I will ask the question. Uh, you've talked about the process of adaptation of the urban fabric, the idea of top down and bottom up. You've talked briefly about the importance of management of that process. I'm interested in the middle and who brokers between top down and bottom up. And does the process of intervention to broker that change in the city? necessarily stifle it or can it be in a self-creative process? No, it can be very, very much a creative process. Um, but it very much depends on the, on the country and it depends very much on the city. I mean, I'm not allowed to say this, you know, but um, the larger the city, this, the more intellectual are the people that you work with. Because, uh, let's say, a town planning uh, town planner uh, starts in the village and wants, if he wants to do his career right, he wants to become uh, the chief town planner of London. So the, the, the more talented people end up in the larger and the bigger cities. And it's the same uh, on, the, on the other levels. So let's say if you work in, uh, in Paris, in the center of Paris, or here in London, or in Amsterdam, uh, this, this or in uh, or in Hamburg in the center, this work is much more easy uh, because the stakeholders are more uh, open uh, and are, let's say have more vision than when you do that in uh, in certain areas in the countryside. I mean, we have we have had this uh, this experience, for instance, in the East German cities uh, before they started to uh, revitalize. It was just completely uh, impossible. You know? Just because of the, of the lack of talent of the different stakeholders, and um, I think uh, uh, it differs also per country, where there is a sense, uh, like I just said, that the, that the municipality has a has a um, has a real power in this play is important. Uh, we have been. Uh, uh, after you uh, left DFL, uh, we experienced a kind of vacuum in that sense in, uh, in London, while working in London, uh, because there was, uh, there was a lack of strength of the municipality to engage in these kind of uh, mediated processes. Whereas, for instance, uh, in Zurich, uh, in Switzerland, they have the canton, the city, and then they have the municipalities within the canton. They are quite uh, efficiently switched into a certain uh, hierarchy, and, uh, and it's very it's, it's very uh, accessible to, to deal, for instance, there with the authorities and with, and, and, and with uh, working on planning instruments, for instance. Um, so it, it, it really differs heavily. Um, Berlin is extremely polarized because everybody wants to grab and get gets his chance. 
um, and the, uh, the, the German uh, political uh, engine is very slow and very bureaucratic, so that's a very tedious project, process. Copenhagen again goes real, relatively smooth, and so it really differs. And in, in, in the East, uh, it's a question of being old uh, and having, having a kind of standing uh, and, uh, and finding your partners, uh, and then it's, it's just the side like that. Thank you. Uh, it's 8 o'clock, it's getting cold. Um, I'm going to draw this to a close. Thank you all for attending. And, and <laughs>